Hi everybody and welcome to our YouTube channel. We are, as always, your hosts, Arne and Carlos. Yes, that didn't change. And today we are knitting a bird in embroidery yarn. Something like this. We'll be see? knitting the bird from beginning to end. You're not going to see us. This is one of our knitting radio podcasts where we'll be talking about whatever comes to mind. So we don't know what we're talking about yet, but we're making a bird. Yeah, so you'll see the whole process. And if you are interested in knitting the bird yourself, remember that you can get it in our book, Knitted Birds. Uh, and these are actually the Norwegian and the French version. We couldn't find the English version. It is somewhere around here. It's the same cover. cover but it's everywhere. the same cover. So you can get it there. And then you can make your own taxidermy birds, but knitted and you put this glass bell, is it called bell? Dome. Dome on top. Perfect. Another thing that you didn't know you needed for your house. So remember to subscribe <laughs> to this video if you like what you see. Uh, or sorry, remember to subscribe to the YouTube channel if you like what you see. And please click the like button for this video. And Arne, let's just clear the table and let's start knitting this. So here's the book, our field guide to knitted birds, and we're going to make one of the birds. But I'm going to put the book away and knit from memory, see if that works. And then, of course, Arne likes a challenge, so he has decided all by himself that he wants to do it the most difficult possible way ever. So he's gotten <laughs> his uh, anchor, stranded cotton yarn. It's the one that is in six strands. And he's going to be using all six strands and he's knitting. As you can see, the needles are tiny. They are, what are they? One and a half millimeters? Well, yeah. The smallest needles you could possibly get in the market. Those are the ones Arne is going to be using. And there's a story behind the needles too, isn't there? But then there? you get tiny birds. Yeah, sure. But tell yeah. us the story behind the needles. I think this is from my great grandmother. I'm not sure if this is the one, but I think this, these are from my great grandmother. Mm -hmm. And they're crooked now because I've been using them for m many, many years. Yeah. And because they're so, they're so tiny, they're so thin, of course they get crooked because they're very bendable because they are uh, such a small size. And I'm a tight knitter, so that's why yeah. Yeah, they get crooked. And I also learned that it's really hard to find such uh, thin needles. I checked in the local yarn store and they don't have the thin needles anymore. So I don't know. You have to go to a flea market or a, a secondhand store maybe. I don't know. Yeah, but they're lovely. I mean, they're, it's nice that you have a few heirlooms from your great grandmother here that you can still use today. Like probably these needles are what, 75, maybe 80 years old. And it's nice that you have them and can use them yeah, like that. this. It's really nice. So yeah, we're going to cast on the bird and we're going to be knitting it from beginning to end. Uh, and of course, in the beginning with the tiny needles and the very thin yarn, it is a little bit fiddly. Even for a knitter like Arne, it's going to be a little bit fiddly in the beginning. But as we start... Then it's like, after a while, it's like peanuts. Yeah. It's no problem. So you'll, you'll all see how, how well this goes. Yeah. Today's uh, radio, knitting radio, as we like to call it, is going to be a longer one because uh, it takes a little bit longer to, to knit the bird. Uh, up until now, our tutorial, or not our tutorials, because this is not a tutorial, this is knitting radio. So our radio podcasts have been about an hour long. I think uh, the hat was an hour and a half, and this one might actually get almost up to two hours, I'm, we're thinking. Uh, mm. We'll see. It, see it'll how be quick I am. interesting to see <laughs> how quick. But I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say that uh, it's manageable under two hours probably not so it means that you have a lot of time to spend with us today uh, what we propose is uh, go put your tea kettle on grab yourself a cup of tea if it's in the evening you could go get a, yourself a glass of wine uh, find your favorite chair uh, I'm sure it's a nice uh, uh, soft plush chair where you sit, maybe it's in front of a fireplace uh, and there's... Not everybody has a fireplace. Well, if you have a fireplace, probably the chair is near the fireplace and you've got uh, <laughs> baskets of uh, different projects that you're working on. So there's some... work on one of the UFOs. One of the UFOs. There's leftover yarn in, yeah. in these little baskets and uh, some of you might actually feel like, oh, um, I'm going to knit the bird together with Arne and Carlos. So if you're going to be doing that, you better hurry up to your bookshelf. 
grab your book, uh, sit down and open it up on, you know, a random page, grab some of that leftover yarn and cast on. And because Arna is using this very small, um, very thin needles and very thin yarn, you'll probably catch up quickly now because he is struggling a little bit <laughs> to start with. I'm, and I'm using like leftover yarn, so embroidery yarn. But if you, if you want to make one in, with embroidery yarn, you need two of those. It's not called balls. What is it called? Skein? I ca- yeah, I think they call them skeins because they're, they're in another format, the yeah. anchor embroidery yarns. Yeah, so skein, you need two, two each. And I don't care what kind of color I use, I just use what I have because we're going to, to, going to put a sequence on, on, top, on top of the of them, bird yeah. and later we will, we will also put feathers. Yeah, so this particular radio podcast is in three parts uh, and uh, this week we're doing part one which is knitting the bird. There will be a part two which is embroidering the bird and a part three which will be decorating it with feathers so, and things. So it's, it's a three part podcast and today it's part one maybe in the end you won't see that it is a knitted bird anymore because it's all covered up with sequins and feathers and whatever you have lying around in your house so maybe yeah. we hide all the knits under yeah maybe the stash yeah and we came up with this idea of doing these podcasts because we do have a lot of things we, we want to talk about uh, we want to do uh, longer uh, videos as well we've been doing a lot of you know, four minute tutorials or, you know, some of our longer tutorials, maybe 20, 25 minutes. Uh, And we were always looking for a format where we could do something longer and talk about things. But um, and then we thought it could be interesting to show hands instead of faces. Um, (laughs) And this is easier because we get we we relax more because we're not, uh, you know, we're not conscious about the fact that there's a camera up our face. I'm never. I know. I mean, I like I like being. <laughs> I don't in front worry of the about camera. that no, because I, I, I look bad all the time. Like my no, bad hair day. You look great. No, but my point is, I, I I don't mind being in front of a camera. I think that both of us have this natural way of being in front of a camera, and I think it works very well to be in from in front of a camera. But at the same time, when you're going to be talking for an hour and a half or two hours, it feels like it's much more relaxing if the camera is not on our face you know what i mean then we can just you know take our take our socks off and put 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 our feet up on the sofa you can sit knit in your underwear no uh if you want no thank you no. <laughs> i'd rather not knitting my underwear knit in nude knit, knit, knit in the nude no we're not in the nude, nude. we're not in, uh, in our underwear we are fully dressed but we're sitting here and we are oh you paint pictures in people's head yeah, well, or that but that's, I did that right. Now. Yeah, but that's that's the, not a nice picture. No, but it's the beauty of the knitting podcast. It's the knitting radio where we put pictures on people's heads, uh, talk about whatever we want to talk about. People get to see your hands working on a fantastic project, and you know, in the end of the day, we'll be covering a lot of different topics, and we will have see what a great yeah. We'll we'll see what happens, and we'll have a great time. And by the end of the day, people will get to know us much better. So, so what do you want to start talking well, about? We prepare, I prepared a lot of topics. Oh. I, have, I have a little list now because we're getting more and more professional at doing this. The first times <laughs> it was very random and, and we were kind of talking about whatever popped in our minds. And we still want to keep it random. So we're giving it a lot of leeway so that we can talk about whatever comes to mind. But I do have a little list of things that we are going to be talking about today or at least we're planning and then we'll see if we do or not. See what happens. Uh, and uh, of course, because we're needing a bird, we are going to be talking about the birds. So and let's spring. talk about birds. Yeah, but let me tell you what else we're going to be talking about today. Oh, you shouldn't do the list. Maybe we don't talk about it. Yeah, but let me talk. Let me tell you what we plan to talk okay. about. Okay. And then we'll see if we do. <laughs> so we're going to be talking about birds. We're going to be talking about uh, real birds and knitted birds. Mm-hmm. Uh, we will be talking a little bit about. Uh, the way we knit the bird and kind of the similarities between this and the sock because there is a little system here you see uh, we will be recapping the live stream that we did a few weeks ago which was really really fun um, and then i thought uh, it could be fun to talk about uh, future tutorials things mm-hmm. that uh, we are planning to do just to get a yes or no from our listeners mm-hmm. and it would also be great if we have time to talk about design give some tips uh, considering um, our work. We've been working professionally for 16 years as designers. We have the training as well, the education, 
Um, and I think that we could, you know, give a lot of useful and helpful tips for people that want to design for themselves. So what do you think, Arne? Are these good topics? It's good. But I don't, I don't want to give away all my best tips. No, but we'll give away... Because they are mine. Yeah. Secrets. Well, but some tips but we some can tips give away. Some tips we can give. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so those are kind of like the topics that we have uh, kind of sketched on. And then we'll see what we end up uh, talking about. And maybe if we forget something, we'll have to put it in the next radio podcast. Mm -hmm. So uh, now the bird. Let's start with the bird. Um, I was saying that it's kind of like a sock heel. Mm -hmm. And the, there is no pattern for the bird, by the way. We haven't, we haven't released the pattern other than in the book. So Because there it's, is a, it's in the book. Yeah, there is a pattern for the bird, but it's not a free pattern. So if you want to knit this bird, you need to get the book. You can go buy it or you can borrow it in your library. Uh, we've got about 100 tutorials, free tutorials and free patterns on our, on our website. And so we feel like we can keep this one for ourselves because there's But so many other things there. You right? can't make a book and give away the pattern. Like, not this one. This not one, this one. It's just keeping. one pattern. Um, and, if you, <laughs> and if you think that's very ungenerous of us, well, we're sorry. But as I said, there is about 100 free patterns on our website, uh, so you can still get so other things. Th but put, anyway. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Yeah. yeah. So the pattern, the pattern for the bird is very straightforward. You cast on, as, as Arna has done. And you knit the round. And you knit on the round. First you do the tail. Yeah. And then you do the rump, where you start increasing on the sides. Yeah, and, and then, then when you, you do the belly. Yeah, and that's when, when you reach that point where you do the belly, you're actually knitting and purling across two needles instead of four. There's two needles on hold, and there's two needles that you'll be knitting and purling to do the stomach. And that will be kind of like a heel. A short row heel. A short row of. here, kind of. It's actually the same. It is, yeah, 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 yeah. And then when you, once you've done the belly, you go knitting on the round, connecting the belly to the rest of the rump that has been on hold. And then you knit the chest... And then you decrease, uh, do the neck, and then you increase again to do the head. So it's a super easy pattern, and it has all these different stages. And as I said, the stage where you do the belly is kind of like a, doing a short row heel. Mm -hmm. So if you've never done a sock before, uh, we can recommend you try the bird if you have the bird book. Practice on the bird. Practice on the bird, because it's a simplified short row heel as well. It's easier. Mm. And then once you've done that, you can do the sock. So that's that's it's the way. Shorter, it's a, exactly. even a shorter row, because it's a few stitches. Yeah. So that's the way we have set up the uh, the bird, uh, and I think that uh, it is it is pretty straightforward, and that's why we don't need the pattern anymore because we remember uh, more or less how it goes. Mm -hmm. The only thing I never remember is how long the tail is. But then we've got different kinds of birds; they have different Length. lengths of tail. Yeah. So that's actually the only variable. But in this the one pattern. is different because we're going to put feathers in the tail on this one. Yeah, so this one just gets a little... This is more like a fantasy bird. It's like the bird you didn't know existed until you made it. Mm -hmm. It's like a danger, how do you say? Oh, that's a, uh, uh, oh, that's a threatened species? It could be. You never know because you don't know what kind of bird it is until it's finished. So you mean like a, a species that is threatened for ex to, to be yeah. extinct? It's yeah. so rare that you have to make it to even see it because mm -hmm. it's not in any book. This, yeah. this is really a strange bird, I guess. Well, I don't know yet because I, ha I have to see what happens when I finish the sequence and then the feathers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can and we see. also had these questions like people who t thought it was strange that we made a book about birds. It's like, why should I knit a bird? People said, some people said. And you know why? Every house needs a knitted bird in their living room or in their drawing room or... Every, yeah. Or on the Christmas tree or yeah. Easter tree. And then, of course, Arne's favorite show. Or, or, I don't think it's your favorite show, but you love that episode in that American show called Portlandia. Yeah, put a bird on it. Yeah, put That's a bird so on cool. it. So put that, a bird on That is Arne's... Uh, he loves that episode. I actually think it's really funny as well. So it's a kind of like a put a bird on it. So uh, That's what we're doing. Thing. We're putting yeah. birds on everything right now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Birds, birds were very trendy uh, for many, many years. Uh, I, th I think that. There's a funny video of you 
telling people that birds are kind of trendy and you're chasing the chickens in the garden. I know, I remember. I think that's on YouTube when we did the Christmas ball book. Yeah, ten year, oh, eight years ago, yeah. Yeah, and you said, oh, birds are so trendy. Yeah, but they so. are. I mean, if you've been out and about, if you like going shopping, if you like looking at, uh, for inspiration, going to home furnishing stores, mm. beautiful stores that sell decor for your home, you'll see a lot of things related to birds. Not only prints on fabrics, but little birds cages and different kinds of things and this has been an ongoing trend for at least eight to ten years. I think years. it's been coming and going like when I was a teacher in the fashion school there was uh, these collections with feathers everywhere mm -hmm. like Terry Mugler, Jean-Paul Gaultier they all had these feather dresses yes. so then every designer who had a feather they put the feather on every like put a bird on it yeah put a feather on it and yeah, birds are definitely trendy and I love it. You know, I love, I love spring. I love going from winter to spring because we have such distinct seasons here in, in Norway. And I don't know, you want to brighten up your, 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 your house. You get, you know, maybe get some fabric with, with birds printed on them and you can do a little cushion for your sofa. Mm -hmm. Just sew up a cushion or two and you put that out over there and voila, you have a little bit of spring indoors with a little bird motif. They're, they're nice creatures. And then, of course, we have this love for variations. Um, so as designers, because we are, I mean, real designers. And sometimes for uh, when we work on a, a, a design idea, we like developing the idea. It's the variation over the theme. Kind of like you do in music, like uh, Bach, Mozart. Mm -hmm. They had their variations, like the Goldberg variations by Johann Sebastian Bach. Mozart has piano concertos and symphonies where there's a variation over a theme. It's, it's all about um, developing a little theme and then seeing how far you can take it, how much you can change, and, but still work within the same idea. We've done it in the Christmas ball book, and now we've done it in the bird book as well. Mm -hmm. And it's a great stimulating way of working uh, when you can actually, work, because you have a limitation. It's very limited what you have. You have this tiny little bird to work on and then you just start variating it and changing it and you know but still keeping it the same mm. but uh, it's like if you have a good idea or if you think you have a good idea why don't use it on more than yeah one thing exactly so um. you variate it and you variate it and you variate it and then in, in, in the end of the day you've got 60 birds so you've got a hundred different birds they're all from the same pattern but they're all completely different it's a great exercise for the brain the creative brain it's always more difficult to work creatively when you have a little you know a little motif or something within constraints mm -hmm. that you that you have to work with and you can't go out of that box that's like the same like when you work in when we worked in the fashion business industry if we made a simple design, it was harder. Yeah. If we did something complicated, it's very easy. And just we could put on whatever we like, uh, yeah. we wanted. It was harder. But to achieve that simplicity, to achieve that uh, the simple things, that is really where the work uh, comes in. We'll get to that later when we talk about design. Mm -hmm. But uh, now we're talking about the the beautiful birds from the book, um, and uh, of course, spring is here. We've had a very tough winter. It's been um, it's been snowing a lot, to been, say the least. Yeah. I'm sure that our listeners have seen pictures we've posted on Instagram. We did the video uh, about the winter wonderland where we showed everybody around here what mm. it looked like. I have a theory based on things I hear on the radio because I like to listen to radio when I do my when I knit or do the design work, and I heard that. They say because of the heat in the polar areas, you mean like get, in the North Pole, in the North Pole for us, and in the South Pole if you're in the South part of the world, we get colder winters because, like a lot of cold air, because of the heat in the North. Yeah. And then they say it's also even if we get cold heat, it's also like where we live, it's milder, so we get a lot of snow, and normally like if it's a cold winter. You normally don't get a lot of snow because it's not snowing when it's cold. Yeah. So I don't know what's going on. It's it, it's all mad. It's madness. Complete madness. This climate. And yeah, there must situation. be some really cold air high up, so it makes makes it snow yeah. all the time. Or I don't know. Yeah, and I think that 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 whole concept of global warming is very confusing because uh, you'd think that global warming means the world gets warmer, but in fact, it's all about 
the North Pole and the South Pole getting warmer and the ice melting and then all those things that happen uh, here in Europe, for get, example, getting colder because of the air, the really cold air that gets pressed down from, from the North Pole and Siberia mm -hmm. and just reaches us. And in March, it was insanely cold here. We had um, the temperature uh, was way down to minus 20 mm -hmm. uh, in the evenings, which is very unusual, minus 20 degrees uh, Celsius, which I think is uh, way below zero as well in Fahrenheit. And it was freezing cold at night, and then of course sun coming out because that's another thing when the when it's really cold, the weather is also really beautiful. Mm. There's no because there's no clouds, there's nothing to kind of yeah mm. stand in the way between that's all why that. That's it's cold. cold because it's clear. Yeah. So 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 it's been a crazy crazy uh, spring, and sometimes you walk around and you feel that there's no hope <laughs> that that it's gonna you know we're not gonna get summer this year. And everything is going to go to hell, basically. And we're just going to be in this, stuck in this eternal coldness and eternal winter. Uh, but then again, in 2014, I remember distinctly that we had a very cold winter as well, with mm. a lot of snow. And then suddenly, from one day to another, summer was here. And we mm. had one of the best summers um, that I can pass. I mean, in Scandinavia, it was one of the best summers I can remember. Yeah, Six weeks. For that. Yeah, six weeks of sun and heat. So mm -hmm. let's let's hope for that. Uh, the snow is is uh, we still have a lot of snow, but um, it's disappearing. Um, and that's another thing because I've been seeing when we post videos on um, on our winter wonderland, or where we posted a lot of Easter images. We, we we're sitting outside at at our snow beach, and I also posted. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's the vid the the photo that I posted, and then we posted the video as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, people are wondering about the snow, if we're going to get a lot of water. And yeah, there's going to be more water, obviously. But luckily for us, we live on top of the mountain. So, you know, the water runs down. The water runs down. So <laughs> it, we won't get it as bad as in other areas of Norway. But I think that if you live further down in the valley, you will have a problem yeah, this spring. Yeah, definitely. They said on the radio that they're like, they're warning people now. Because if there's a heat wave coming, there will be a lot of water. Yeah. coming down so luckily we are on top of a mountain yeah and nowadays the snow is melting as we speak uh it's uh it's something that the eye can't even see you get all this snowfall and it's quite fluffy and then it gets really cold and it turns into ice and then the sun shines on it and it starts melting and a lot of it actually just vaporizes into thin air so you mm. it's not even it just disappears and then you've got the the rest kind of sinks down so from one day to another, you can have a lot of snow that has just basically disappeared and it's not even there. So um, I remember reading a comment, people were asking if it gets muddy here and it doesn't really get muddy. No, there's no mud. There's not mud. And the, the road maybe a little bit. The road might get muddy. Yeah. Not in the garden. Oh, you mean our driveway? Yeah, the yeah, driveway. Our driveway will, will get muddy. But not in the garden or on the, no, no, in front not of much. the house. Never muddy. And and I'm sure that I'm sure that by May we won't even remember the snow anymore. No. Hopefully, it's really amazing when we look at the pictures from last summer or other summers. It's actually hard to believe that it it happens because it's so different from what we have in winter. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it's like in like a, a few months we have a jungle in the garden. Yeah, another so, thing that depresses me is when you you know close to, in mid May. When we drive down to buy food, we have to drive about eight kilometers downhill. And when we get down to the valley, it's all beautiful and green. But Because we're like two weeks later. We're two weeks we... later, yeah. So when we drive down for, to shop groceries, it's beautiful. It's green. You feel spring is here. And then you drive up to where we live and it's all brown because the, the leaves and the birch trees haven't uh, started blossoming yet. So, so that's, that's really bad when you live high up in the mountains. You have a late spring. But then again, we have... We have uh, the blooming in the garden. Yeah. Goes on forever. Forever. Afterwards. Yeah. Afterwards. So like we have our, we have our lilies in, in the end of August mm -hmm. and September. Then yeah, the lily. October. Octo then the lily starts to bloom. So sometimes when the snow comes in, in the autumn, we have flowers blooming mm -hmm. in yeah. the snow. So that's really nice because it goes on forever. Yeah. And then May is the hideous month here. It's the ugliest month. I hate May here. And that's for us the best time to go on holiday. So 
when people they do their holidays in July or August. Oh, that's the best that's time. when we do not travel at all. We are in the garden. Mm. And so if we need a holiday, if we need to go get away from this depressing uh, weather, we'll go in, in May because that's the ugly month. So we'll go to the south of Europe somewhere to, to get a little bit of sun and to kind of avoid being here and just getting still depressed because it's getting green everywhere except here and then of course <laughs> it goes very quickly because once it's the, the leaves start coming it goes you know in days from one day to another it's all green so mm. so there's always that to look forward to but april may april, march april are good months because of the fact that we go into daylight saving time i think it's called when you go from yeah. winter time to summertime the days get brighter uh, already now it's still light at 7 7 30 mm. and it's just gonna keep going uh, and keep getting lighter and lighter and lighter the birds are back the birds have been here for a while now they yeah. came in march the summer birds haven't arrived yet but they will they will come they will like come yeah in the month maybe? but we've, we've had a lot of birds coming yeah uh, we had these birds that that stays during winter so this winter we have been feeding the birds a lot we have like yeah. feeders up in the trees everywhere in the garden and i have to say they're greedy these little birds oh, oh my God. these little they, buggers they, they cost a fortune they are so greedy <laughs> you know you go and you put the uh, sunflower seeds in their little thingies mm. and two days after there's nothing there and you can actually notice that they are upset yeah, yeah. it's like, like where's our food and this winter we've been feeding them so much yeah. so when i one day when i was feeding the birds they actually they one of them jumped on on my on the feeder while i was holding yeah it. that was so cute so, it was probably starving probably i don't know how can got... they starve we feed them every yeah. every day it's wow. like so much food there yeah, and we have uh we've learned our lesson we uh we live it we live out in the we live on the mountains so we have no problem with rats. Uh, I think that uh, a lot of people that live in cities, even in Oslo, mm. might have uh, rat problems. We don't have rats. But we don't we have, have we don't have any rat problems. But we have cute, very cute little like, forest mice, like Magnus garden mice. Well, they're tiny, tiny, book. tiny. They're completely harmless. They yeah. don't even have any diseases. They're just tiny little forest mice. But we, if we feed the birds too close to the house. Uh, we might actually get an infestation indoors. We had that two years ago uh, because we fed the mice near the... Uh, the but yeah, we fed the mice. We fed the birds, <laughs> the birds near the house and the mice came in in fall when we were touring in America. So when we came back, our housekeeper said that there is a lot of mice here now. So we had to go and get mice trap and try to get um, rid of them. Mm. And now we're feeding them further down the garden. Um, Quite far away from the house. Have you also that... got this electricity thing? Yeah. Like this noise? Yeah, yeah the noise thing is good because... It scares them? The, yeah, we have this little thing. Uh, we put it, we plug it in the wall in the in the basement. And then it and sends out some signals? Yeah, it sends out signals that the mice don't like. But usually you need to... You need to get the mice out of the house first before you put that on. Because if they're in the house, they will be <laughs> reluctant to leave because there's all that good stuff here. So you have to stop feeding the mice in the house and then you can plug this yeah. thing. So now that we don't have mice, we have the, the sound barrier, we call it. It works now. Yeah, and then we have the, the birds that are being fed outside uh, in the garden. And hopefully the mice are also having their feast Probably over there. They live in in between the flower. Yeah. And if as long as they're down there, it doesn't bother us. We don't want them in the house, but we want them. We want them in the garden because they're important as well. They do their own. They're little, cute, you know. but I think in the house, it it's enough with the knitted mouse. Yeah. In a sweater. Exactly. That's enough for yeah. the house. Yeah. It's funny how we're gonna we say we're gonna talk about birds and then we end up talking about mice. So let's go back to the birds. <laughs> the birds. Uh, so uh, we got very inspired by. The whole variation, the theme, the variations over the theme, the theme being the birds, and then creating the birds. We started with garden birds. Uh, that was the first group of birds yeah. we made. We needed all the birds we found in the garden or the, what, the birds we saw in the garden. Exactly. So that was kind of, that was the beginning. But, you know, in Norway, we don't have a lot of colorful birds in our garden. So after a while, it, it ran was... Out. It was a lot of gray and black and white, mm -hmm. a mix of those three. Yeah, there's a bird here in Europe. Uh, if you're in America, you may not know it, but I think, yeah, I think you may know it because we have different birds. 
we have different birds here uh, compared to I America. I think this is all over. If you talk the about the blue tit, the blue tit. I think the blue tit is everywhere. Is everywhere? I know for sure the blue tit is uh, Europe. Uh, they know it in the UK. They call it the Norwegian parrot because it's the most yeah, on the radio. Colorful. There was a guy who said we have this colorful bird. It's like a parrot. But well, it's not a parrot. It's but not, but it's co- colorful. It's the equivalent of the of the Australian parrots that you have on the on the trees. Those beautiful birds, mm. and we have the blue tit, which is the most colorful bird we have in Norway. Um, and then um, that's the most colorful, and from there it's all downhill. It's all gray <laughs> and white mm. and black, and a little bit of red. We've got the um, don't pop. What's that? Oh, geez. Now we're gonna start with the birds. Oh. Uh, the 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 robin no that's the other one but that's we have a red robin and we have the was that like three years ago yeah well it's not supposed to be in Norway or I not, think it is but, yeah, but not here not here I've never seen it before so I think it's new up here because we're high up and I've never seen a a red robin before in like never yeah and we were very surprised you know we we had this bird in the garden. And it wasn't shy, was it? No, we were sitting in the garden and suddenly there was this little bird. He came out of one of the bushes in the garden and he was looking at us. And we talked to him and he was just sitting there staring. And then he jumped. He wasn't flying that much. He was more like jumping under the bushes and onto the branches. And then I had to check in one of the bird books. And the the description matched what we saw. Yeah, it was a robin. Of a, red robin. a red robin, yeah. So I think we have, and I, I saw it also last year, so I think we have had that bird in the garden it's for climb, three it's, summers. It's because now. of climate change. They're Probably coming it because came it's, with the wind or yeah, something. Yeah, and it's getting warmer here, so. So he likes it in the garden. Yeah. So yeah, all this climate change is making really crazy mm. things happen. Uh, we have swallows as well. Uh, yeah. I mean, those, we've had them here They've all been the time. They've been here forever. And we always know when it's going to rain. We don't need to have a, one of those barometers indoor. Because no. we know when, when in the summer, we always know in advance when it's going to rain. Because you just have to look at how, how the swallows behave. That is really, that's a good weather forecast. That's the best weather forecaster. And then we can just run and grab all, well, we don't run because we have advance notice. So we can just mm-hmm. go and grab all the cushions from our sofas on the outdoor deck and bring them indoors. Because you know it will be raining yeah. in like not so long. And so. now I'm sure people are wondering, so how can you know, how do you know when it's going to rain? What do the swallows do that kind of give you that advance notice? Yeah, and that is, you want to tell it? Or? Yeah, they, they fly very low yeah. because we have the lake. You see them flying very close to the water, yeah, very and also low. also so low, they, 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 they come under the veranda roof. Also. Sometimes, yes. So, so sometimes they just fly above our heads, and that's really low. And you know that because they're flying so low, you know that it's going to rain eventually. And they, I don't know why they do this. It's probably know. an instinctive thing. I don't know if they're getting... Maybe it's windy up there. Or... Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, could be. Yeah, could, could be. be. So, so when the swallows fly low, it's a sure sign that there will be rain coming. And effectively, there is always rain it's coming. It's always raining yeah. when the swallow flows. And then we have this thing where we... Uh, Arne is very clever. He likes building things in the summer. He, you know, he knits, but in the summer he likes building things. So one summer or one spring, Arne came up with this fabulous idea. I was to... so smart. Yeah, you were so smart. You came up with this idea of, of uh, where to put our skis. Yeah, that was and, a really bad and idea. And you built, you built, Arne built this, this little thing on, on, on the roof, uh, but Up on under. the inside, under the roof, on our, on our veranda. We have a roof co- covered veranda and it's got these beams that stick out. And then he made a little thingy so that we, we could put the skis up there. So I thought were... that was really smart because then I don't have to go in the snow to one of the other outhouses yeah. and find the ski in, in the autumn. So we put the skis, so they were under the roof on top. I mean, when we were in the veranda, we, we could look up and we could see the skis. Um, but the thing was that there was this now suddenly this closed space <laughs> between where our skis were and the top of the roof on the inside. And so the swallows decided that this was 
a great place to start nesting. So they started to build them their, their nests, nests there. And of course, we started to notice it when we saw a little bit of poo on the floor. <laughs> bird, poo bird poo on the floor. And it was on the grill, on the barbecue, on the lid of the barbecue. And uh, we looked up and we could see some mud sticking out yep. from where the skis were. And they were really annoying. And they were very annoying. So we had to take the skis down. Um, and they got upset because, of course, their nest was gone. So in the end, I, I, in the end, I had to had to put up some plastic, like to try to cover up, cover yeah, up. Yeah. But they didn't give up at all. So in the end, I had to take the skis down and put them in the outhouse. So and at times they were actually we were sitting there, and suddenly there would be these two swallows kind of sitting up on up on the roof but on the outside of the veranda looking at us you know they're not shy at all no and they were looking at us kind of like accusing us of of taking away their home or something they looked upset but they're so they were so beautiful they're very it was beautiful. kind of a pity that we had to get get Rid them the nests, out of there yeah. but but they were really beautiful and you like we could sit there and talk to them in the evening they just sat and looked at us yeah i think we were, that was nice and we were very concerned that they would keep building every year there but um they stopped they did yes because i i don't i don't want to put the skis up under the roof no anymore. not anymore not anymore and there's a lot of other places around here where they can build so i don't know why but you know it's not raining they don't get wet under the roof and yeah it's, it's nice probably and very practical for them yeah so it's, it's toasty up there so we've got the swallows, we've got the uh, we've got the blue tits, yeah, and the black one, the um, oh, the one that comes early in spring, which is that one, the magpie. Trost. No, the magpie is always yeah, around. Yeah. The trost, trost. I don't know. Oh. We'll need to look up the Latin names. Yeah. If, it's a black black bird, and he comes early in spring, and then he jumps around where there's no snow, and he's like. Uh, twisting his head and like listening to the ground be because I, I heard some sometimes that like he's listening for the worm 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 is that worm worms what? worms and then he can hear the wor worm some people say yeah so. and then we have our ducks that come every year yeah we had like in in the beginning, first years we had four so two couples or two couples and and they Two come... years ago, there was only three. So one of the ducks died. Probably, so, yes. So now he's, he or she is coming by himself, himself or, herself. or herself. But they're then, always coming. And then the other couple is coming as well. Yeah, and they're always... They're still alive. <laughs> yeah, and they usually, come, they usually come in May, in early May, when the snow or when the ice in the lakes melts. Yeah, there's like only small holes in the in the ice where they can uh, go down and pick yeah, up fish. Yeah, and then they and then when the snow when the ice melts, they're swimming in the lake and and usually we only see them here in in spring, right? Like May. Then by June they're gone again. Well, they're probably around, but they don't. I don't. I don't know. They have maybe they have kids somewhere. Yeah, yeah, because we see them Chickens? for a while and no. then what we don't saying? see them. What's a what's a bird kid? What's the name? A duckling? A duckling? Maybe. <laughs> a duck chicken? Duck chicken? We can yeah. make up some new words. If and we... then they disappear They disappear for, uh, after a while, but they come every spring, so it's always nice to greeting them. And I hope that, I mean, they're not going to live forever, mm. but I do hope that uh, in time there will be other ducks coming to our lake. It's really nice having these mm. sweet birds there. And you know that spring is definitely here when you see them coming in. Mm. We also have eagles somewhere in the woods. A guy told me that there are eagle nests in in the woods around here, but but we haven't seen them. I've never seen an eagle here in this area. And Freya, our poodle, haven't seen them, seen the eagle either, and that's good for her. Yeah, <laughs> you have to watch out when she's out in summer. Well, I don't think it's a problem now, but when she was a puppy, it would have been really. Yeah. Well, she's not Dangerous. that heavy anymore. No, she's still a little. Yeah, she's dog. a small dog. Yeah, but she's a tough one. Yeah. And we have the is it called heron, the big gray. Oh yeah, the heron. Yeah. That is. They are so beautiful, and we have one, and she's always or he is. They're always around the lake in summer, and I think it was last summer. I was watching the heron from the second floor. Yeah, with the binoculars. Yeah, he was walking. 
next to the lake, like in the stairs we have. That was so cool. It's like so it's so huge. And he was picking up fish from the from the water. Yeah. So fantastic. We don't have to go to the cinema because we have like movies in our garden. So you can all understand now the interest in birds that we have and the fact that starting out with a simple pattern, a basic pattern for a bird, and then creating all these different birds, and then of course doing the birds of paradise and all the make-believe birds. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, uh, going traveling abroad to other parts of the world that is not Europe, where we have different kinds of birds. Like in, Amer in North America, we saw the cardinals. Mm -hmm. We don't have card cardinals oh, in Europe. The stellar jays. And the hummingbirds. And the hummingbirds are fantastic. Beautiful. We, we don't have hummingbirds in... This I, could be like a hummingbird when I finish it. Yeah, this is going Maybe. to be a humming, hummingbird, yeah. Maybe. But for us <laughs> in Norway, hummingbirds don't come here. I don't know if there are hummingbirds in the south of Europe, but I would suppose. Probably. Yeah, I Maybe. Yeah, I think it is. But not here. Not mm. here at all. Um, yeah, and then of course Australia was incredible. <laughs> Walking around and looking up at the trees and seeing cockadoos and rosellas and parrots. And I mean, you can see... You, I'm sure that Australians can see immediately who is the, the European, <laughs> European or American tourist. Those are uh, the pe people like us who are photographing trees in the park where everybody else is just walking like, like uh, you know, it's an everyday thing for them. And you have these tourists taking pictures of, of the birds in the tree. That's but us. We're like looking more up than around us. So we're like almost stepping on people. Yeah, it was very like, exotic uh, going to Australia and seeing all these amazing species up in the trees. And of course we got the bird book. We so, got the Australian bird book. So that we have we, a lot of inspiration for new birds. Yeah, so we'll see if we do the bird book part two. You never and, know. And then of course we have, what was I going to say? Oh yeah, and the magpies in Australia were scary. Yeah, they say they were dangerous. We didn't have any. Oh, we, I saw one fly saw very one, low and attack yeah. a woman's head. Well, she was wearing or, a beanie, yeah. a hat, so she was fine, but... She kind of, the magpie flew very low and it was like acting in, in that way where she, the magpie was saying, this is my territory, you better get out of here now. Probably what she said. That's what or, she was saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, but Australia and those birds were fascinating. So uh, I can't wait to go back and see more, more beautiful parrots and cockadoos. Although cockadoos. the cockadoos were pretty noisy. But, but they were beautiful. They were quite so. beautiful, yeah. So, uh, yeah, and then, of course, Alaska. We have, uh, we've been in contact with this lady uh, who has a store mm -hmm. called The Net Loft. And she's doing this big uh, project. It's called the Birds by Hand Project, where she's doing this massive exhibition of birds, uh, migratory birds. Uh, and she's asking for knitted birds uh, from all over the world. Uh, and, uh, you know, from our book, but also from other books for her exhibit. And if you want to have some more information about that, uh, you just need to Google the net loft. That's but, the net loft. The internet address is www.thenetloftak.com. But just Google the net loft Alaska and, and you'll find it. Uh, and if you want to donate a bird and, and send it over, I'm sure there's still time. You can contact... Uh, but you said migratory bird? Is that bird that... That migrate, yeah, they migrate? Go, they leave um, Alaska and then they come back. Okay, but in, what in about the, the bird I found? We found the bird which we're going to send, and that's the blue tit. Yeah, but it's any bird. It's not migrating, is it? No, it says here it's I, migrating to Canada from Norway. It no to Alaska. To, from Norway to Alaska in an envelope. Yeah, so it says here. That's uh, a migrating bird. Yeah, but anyway, it says here our goal is to create a display of one thousand knitted and handcrafted birds from all over the world. So they don't okay. have to be, they don't have to be migratory. No, they uh, just the, came to Alaska. Yeah, and then it says the birds will, put, will be put on display at the Cordoba Center and the Cordoba Museum Art Gallery during the Copper River Delta Shorebird Festival in the spring, so in May. Mm -hmm. um, and anybody, it says that all handcrafters and birders near and far are welcome, are welcome to take part in the project. And then it says you can participate by creating one bird or a whole flock. You mm -hmm. may use the patterns... Uh, in the book A Field Guide to Knitted Birds by Arne Carlos Knitted Birds by Nikki Fialkowska or any knitted bird pattern so, so it's any, any pattern and mm -hmm. it says further on we encourage handcrafted birds of all types traditional birds or personalized birds add glasses or a hat as shown in the Arne Carlos book the more variety of birds the better 
We would like to hear of your bird progress. Send us pictures. All handcrafty mediums and types are encouraged. So you can oh. knit them, you can felt them, you can crochet them, you can wool felt, applique, and embroider them. Maybe we should send this bird. Well, we're sending a bird, uh, and we're sending it to the net loft, mm. uh, and it's in Alaska. So the net loft alaska.com if you just google the netloft alaska you'll find the uh, the website and then from there you can you can do your bird and send it to this wonderful display that's a nice thing to do yeah i think it's nice it brings people from all, all over the world together and the birds together and all the birds from all <laughs> over the, the world together knitted yeah. birds from all over the world which is really nice it's that's it's nice. uh it's a, it's a great thing to do, and I'm, I'm, nice. I'm very excited that we are able to donate a bird from our collection as well, so that there, there will be an Arn and Carlos bird on display as well. And there will probably be many Arn and Carlos birds on display if people knit from, from our, book. our book. So, so that, that's going to be brilliant. And yeah, glasses, you can put little hats on them, like our Peruvian birds. Mm -hmm. You could do you know birds from different cultures by adding a little... A little something, maybe a dirndl skirt from Bavaria to have a German bird. <laughs> or you could do a bird that looks like you, like we did. Yeah, like, like the ones on the cover yeah, of our book. Do, you can do whatever you want. Or do a bird with an Eskimo sweater if you come from uh, Greenland or Alaska. Or you can do a pearl embroidery. A pearl embroidery bird. You can do, uh, yeah, birds of fancy feathers from Australia, like the cockatoos, the... <laughs> the kookaburra, the kookaburra. That's the traditional Australian. <laughs> well, the bird. paradise bird. That's the nice birds bird. of paradise. The hummingbirds. The hummingbirds. Yeah. So there's yeah. so many birds, and we're so happy that we have them around us. It's it's uh, wonderful, uh, especially us coming from a winter country where uh, we go from almost no birds to lots of birds in mm. the in the spring. You know, like when we we sometimes we fill our birds with the leftover yarn, like when we sew the sew the tail and you cut all the ends. Yeah. We do the carder, carding, and then we put that in our birds or in our balls or whatever. Mm -hmm. And we been we were told once that we should shouldn't do it. We should put it out in the garden, up in the tree, because pe the birds like it if when they do their nest. Mm -hmm. And I tried. I put a lot of yarn in one of the trees in the garden like three years ago. And what happened? Nothing. They didn't want it? No. Our birds are too picky. They're they very spoiled, like... yeah. Nothing happened. The yarn is still in the tree. I don't know. And it's even next to a birdhouse. Yeah. Well, anywhere in this garden is next to a birdhouse. Yeah, because we collect birdhouses and we love birdhouses. And we love having a lot of them all over the place. We make them, we buy them. Uh, and I mean, we've got birdhouses everywhere. I mm. mean, we go to a National Trust property when we're on holiday in the UK. They might have a fun little birdhouse in the store. And of course, we're going to buy it because we want to support the National Trust. And, you know, if you spend a little money when you're at a National Trust property, you know that that money is going into the upkeep of these wonderful oh, the properties. Beautiful so, property. so, so yeah, we, uh, and we'll t we tend to buy the book probably on the property mm. and then a little birdhouse or, or a little something for the garden because they have really great stuff in or the, the UK. Or the bee house. What do you call it? The bee house? The, yeah, the little bee house bee as well was really fun. We bought a bee house in Sissinghurst. You mean like an insect hotel? Insect hotel in Sissinghurst. And that was strange because we posted a picture of the bee house and then some a person wrote and said, these holes are too small for the bees. And then I How can you say that when you see it on a picture? I don't know. And National Trust sells it in Sissinghurst. Yeah. They should know what they're doing. Yeah, so I kind of wanted to say, well, you, you, should, <laughs> well, you should bring that up with the National Trust because yeah. we didn't make it, we bought no, it. No, we didn't make, make it. Please write yeah. National Trust and complain. Yeah. And then we went to, we go to antique stores or, or we love going to these um, thrift stores in the countryside. So wherever we are, like, uh, if we go to Denmark for things, we want to go out into the countryside to look oh, at Denmark these. is so good. For yeah, Denmark stuff. is great for thrift stores in the countryside. It's kind yeah. of, it's literally barns filled with stuff that people don't want. And I, I remember on one occasion, we got a really nice birdhouse. But that was in America. No, I'm talking about the birdhouse that has the oh, stick. Oh, that's yeah. a nice one. That's from Denmark. That's from Denmark. That's from yeah. Denmark. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we have a very special one that we bought in Hudson. In New York. That's the that most. That is the... But that is so beautiful, we can't keep it out. No, that, that birdhouse is the only one that we treat 
and cherish and keep indoors and make sure that it's always happy indoors because it's, it's so beautiful it's so it's like uh, this american house with the front porch or or it's like something you can see in the disney movie it's like yeah. new england style it's a new it, england style birdhouse and it was probably b- built around 1890 or 1900. Actually, there's a picture of the birdhouse in one of our books. Yeah. In the Knit and Crochet Garden book. Yeah. And it was made by an amateur. So it's not, it's not a, it's not a professional piece made by a renowned artist or carpenter. It's somebody who made this for their own pleasure. It's recycled, actually. I think it's made of cigarette boxes. Cigar boxes. Cigar boxes. Because when we got it home, and I, I tried to put it up on the shelf and while I was doing it, I heard this noise in the birdhouse. There was mm-hmm. something moving around and I managed to get the finger through a window and grab a piece of paper that was just moving around in the house. And there was a small picture of some people sitting around the table playing cards and smoking cigarettes. Mm-hmm. That's why I think it's from a... Like cigarette, is it called C- cigar box? A cigar, cigar box. box, yes. Oh, Freya. We have Freya here, oh, and she stop. is she starts don't, barking because she's feeling bored, probably. Don't be angry. Yeah. Be happy. Be happy. Anyway, yeah. Hudson was a great place to buy to look at antiques as well. Fairly expensive uh, shops, but it was very inspiring, and I'm happy that we were able to leave with a, a bird's house. house. We bought it in 2011 when the conversion rate from Norwegian kroner to dollar was much better than now. Now everything in America is so expensive for us uh, because the dollar is so strong. But in 2011, it was the opposite. Everything was pretty cheap. So we were happy that we had a possibility to go there and buy something. And we haven't been back to uh, Hudson, but I'd love to go back at some point. Mm. It's such a nice place. I would like to go back. I think there, there. I heard there are more places in that area also with yeah, antique yeah. stores and secondhand stores. And yeah. What we need to do is give give ourselves some time when we tour the U.S. and we tour that area. We should take a few extra days off mm. to do a little bit of antiquing while we're in the area. Yeah. That's that's for next time. Yeah. And now we have some friends and they bought a house somewhere up there, so we can even we maybe can even we can go and hang out at the house, and hang out with them. And then when we don't have to spend money in a hotel, we have a little extra money for shopping, <laughs> which is always well, good. Selfish. Yeah, very <laughs> selfish. So the bird's progressing. The body is, you know, being the shaped. Body, body, body. Body, 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 and uh, you know, at one point we will have a finished bird. Uh, it's going to take a little longer than uh, than usual, so this tutorial, or not tutorial actually, this podcast is going to take, uh, say, about two hours. So yeah, the, it's, always, it's very good to, for us to you know, look for different things to do, mm. uh, different formats, uh, and I'm very happy now. We've got, the, uh, we've got the tutorials, right? We've got the Q&As, mm. and now we also have the live stream. Mm-hmm. Um, and the live stream that we did in March was amazing. I mean, it was very nervous. We, it was nerve-wracking because we didn't know how many people uh, we were going to be listen, talking no. to. Uh, and be, I, I have to say, it was a huge success. So let's, let's do a little recap. I think it was now. fun because it was nice to like, have direct contact with people. Mm-hmm. I, I think that was cool. Yeah. And, and you get the answers and you, you can answer there and then. Mm-hmm. I, that was really good. So the whole thing started, it started with the fact that uh, we have a team, right? There's a team of people that come and do the filming for us because we want it to be done in a professional way. We want everything that we do to be professional. So we've got, we've got a great team of, uh, of people that are collaborating with us on this project. There's Eric, the camera guy. Mm-hmm. There is Anna. Anna is uh, the director, the managing director, uh, I like calling her. And then we have PJ. PJ is the the boss. He kind of he kind of comes here and he sits on his computer and he kind of supervises everything. <laughs> and then we've got Arna and me who are responsible for the content. Uh, it's a great it's a great great team effort. Um, and uh, and we've been working uh, together since the beginning. So they've always been with us. Uh, originally they'd come they'd come uh, on for a day. And we'd film a number of episodes in one day. Uh, but now, because of the whole possibility of, of live streaming, we decided that they'd come for a weekend. So Anna and Eric, they came to, to spend a whole weekend here, spend the night, 
so that we could do the live stream. And that mm -hmm. has to be done that way because we have an American audience uh, that we need to reach. And so we need to start uh, the live stream when it's evening here in Norway. Otherwise, we have a problem uh, in terms of how many people we reach. So it was all about uh, publishing the or starting the live, the live stream at about 11, 12, uh, 11 a.m., 12 uh, p.m. Central Standard Time in America in order to get people to join us because mm. uh, we wanted to interact. And then I didn't know that, in fact, the live stream is there forever. I, I kind of understood that, but I didn't think about it. So we were really nervous that, and thinking that people won't actually see the live stream because there's not going to be enough people hanging out with us, interacting. Uh, yeah, so there's all kinds of worries and concern and uh, concerns. Eric was very nervous about uh, the setup, the, techno the technology, because you don't want to make an announcement, right? That, oh, we're going to be live streamed tomorrow at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. And then at 11 Central Standard Time, something happens with the technology. Or nothing and, happens. Or nothing happens <laughs> and you're not uh, live. So, so we actually spent two hours uh, setting it up, or Eric did. Uh, connecting everything so that we weren't on Wi-Fi. Everything was done uh, with cables. But we have the best internet. We have really good internet here because we have broadband fiber. Like if we go to Oslo and stay in a hotel, we complain about the internet mm. all the time because it's so slow or there's no connection or there's always problems. Yeah. And we live on top of a mountain. Yeah. And we have the best. Yeah, well, it costs... And it costs us money to get that installed. But then again, when you are working as designers, as we do, and sending huge files, uh, yeah, we, need with, we, need, we need broadband, which is quick. So Eric was very happy about the speed of our internet here. And he had everything set up two hours in advance. And he did a great job with lighting. Mm -hmm. I have to say, because it's not, this is a production. So we've got cameras. Uh, there were two cameras on us. And then we were also lit from above. And mm -hmm. we wanted to have the, the window with the sunset and everything was timed so that uh, when we were going to be finishing the, the, the live streaming, which we had decided was going to be half an hour, the sun was going to be setting at the same time. And it's nice because you've got these people that you can collaborate with and then you can do a lot of creative talking, you know, how, how do you want this? How should we do this? And, and, and so you get all this input from other people and you get all these great ideas together. So it's like a big, big team effort, um, which I love. I love working in teams like that. So in the end of the day, everything worked like clockwork. Uh, we were live at exactly the time we said we were going to be live. And by the time we were finishing up the live stream, which you can see if you go to our YouTube channel, if you haven't seen it, you can see it there. The sun is setting behind us. So it's all spectacular. Uh, and then, of course, the big concern, because all of the, those things are now, those are the things you can control. Mm. You can control what time you're going to... As long as the technology works, you can control when you're going to get on. You can kind of plan what you're going to say. And you can kind of plan it to finish when the sun is setting. But then there's the element you can't control. How many people are going to be logging on? How many people are we going to be interacting with? Is it going to be my mother in Spain? Actually, my mother doesn't do internet. <laughs> no, she doesn't do internet. So <laughs> it's not going to be her. But is it going to be my dad? Is he going to be the only one supporting us or is there going to be anyone but then we could have a conversation with your father that's not so bad that's not so bad at all but i wanted to talk to people from all over the world <laughs> yeah and so and then we did this thing where we were hesitant about posting until the very same day so we just posted a small video on youtube and instagram and facebook and i was so surprised and so happy when we got about i think at most it was 720 people Mm -hmm. that were live with us and we were getting all the comments all that they were popping up on the screen all the time so we're doing this again oh yeah, or, yeah yeah we are so totally doing this again but we talked about doing it in the garden is that possible with uh, eric's yeah, connection yeah. in the garden well yeah eric said that he would just buy some really long cables oh, oh so course. we'll just have cables coming out of the house into the <laughs> garden so that's uh, possible because then we can do it in the garden next time. That's what we're hoping. Uh, be nice. Unfortunately, we can't do the live stream as often as we want unless we do it in a more amateur way. Uh, if we're going to do it in an amateur way, we could do it every week. But we now don't want to do that. just put on the camera on the computer and, yeah. and squeeze in. But that's not what we no, want to do. We want to give people. We want to. You know, we want to be. We want to be live. We want to interact with people. But we also want to give people an experience. And I think that. 
get, you know, having a team of, you know, Anna, Eric and PJ helping us out and, you know, creatively coming up with a great concept is much, much better. It gives more to the viewers. I felt that um, mm. we came to our first live stream very prepared and the feedback was that we were very prepared. We had a topic. We were going to talk about UFOs and we were going to get people to tell us about their UFOs. And they would be reading comments out loud and then kind of talking back to people as we showed them our UFOs. And I have to say, I it couldn't have gone better than mm. how it went. It was kind of like what I was seeing in my head. Do you agree? Was yeah. that kind of what you were thinking? Actually, I didn't understand what we were doing. I had problems understanding it. What do you mean? I didn't understand anything until we sat there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Then I suddenly I realized that, oh, we are actually talking to you people mean, right now. Uh, okay, like, so you mean you didn't understand no, the technology? No, it took a, little, took a little time before I understood the technology. Yeah, thing, okay. Because I was like more all over the place and yeah. a little bit lost in my head. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, because you had the biggest job. Your job, which is the most important in that kind of a setting, is to actually find the UFOs. Yeah, and they are everywhere. Yeah. So that was a little bit stressful. Yeah, everybody knows already now. Everybody knows because we've done... A few videos where we keep saying that we were going to do that, but we couldn't find that. Like there's the Easter decoration video. We yeah, did I still this haven't year. found the Easter eggs. Yeah. So for I everybody wondering where are if we found our Easter eggs, the answer is no. No. We don't <laughs> we know where they are. Ones. And somebody actually made had a comment that made me laugh. You know, because I remember when I was a kid, we go on an egg hunt. Yeah, we you know, never. Parents, mm. parents hid the eggs, and the kids had to go hunting, looking for the eggs. And somebody was laughing uh, at that comment that we had on the video where we couldn't find the eggs and saying that, oh, we've been on an Easter egg hunt. <laughs> and actually our Easter egg hunt is still going because we still don't know where our eggs are. But uh, we have a suspicion that they actually might be in South Korea. Yeah, because we made this exhibition in South Korea and this, all the stuff is still there. So yeah. Maybe the the eggs are in South Korea. I have a suspicion that those eggs are uh, at the embassy, the Norwegian embassy in South Korea. They were maybe uh, yeah, because a lot of our work was exhibited in a museum of modern art in uh, South Korea, the Gwangju Museum of South, of Modern Art, and I've forgotten completely about that. And you see, too much things happening around here. Exactly, it's really hard to. Remember. So it's funny though. It's funny though how we say we can't find our eggs, and then and then we say something about the house eating up the eggs, and then we realize that oh maybe the eggs are in South Korea. So from from having a house to that eats eggs to having eggs in South Korea, I mean the the span of where we live things, is, where we leave things, is incredibly long, huge. huge. So we're we're losing things in South Korea, in Copenhagen, in Minneapolis, or in our house. We don't even know anymore because it's all over the place. But it's cool. I mean, it means that we are leaving our mark in the international <laughs> yeah. arena. Yeah. And I think that uh, it is really amazing. I'm so grateful for this. Every single day that I wake up, I'm grateful that we can do what we do best and we do it well and have all these people Re love it. Remember when we left the car key and the door, the key to the door in the bag in the flat in Paris many years ago? Yes. That is kind of leaving your mark somewhere. Yep. That was horrible. Yeah. So we had, we had this apartment in Paris that we rented when we were uh, back in the day when we were working in fashion because we had a lot of dealings in Paris. So we rented an apartment there and we had been to Paris to do the fabric trade show called the Premier Vision where you talk to all the fabric suppliers and look at fabrics for days and days. Yeah, and where you can like, you get the new trends. The new and trends. The, the new colors. Everything fabric based. Yeah. So we were there and then we were going to go home because we had something to do at home. And then we were going to go back to the apartment in Paris because of Paris Fashion Week, where we're going to be showcasing our collection in the trade shows. So I come up with this brilliant idea uh, and I say to Arna, why don't we just leave these bags here? Because we're going to come back anyway. <laughs> and what we realized when we get to the airport. We left the wrong bag. Basically, when we're boarding the flight, we realized that the car keys, because our car is parked at the airport in Oslo. So the car keys are in the bag that I told Arna to leave. So that was fun. And then we met this, this couple on the plane and the guy said that he had a friend who, who could, was a criminal. And he could break into and our car. And he knew how to break into cars. So if we needed help, he could call this guy. But I felt that... that and was, I was like, 
No, no, that's not happening. I felt that was going a little bit too far. So in that the end, was a little bit strange. In the end, we called our neighbor because we have a neighbor on the other side of the lake. She has a cottage. It's not a real home, so she doesn't live here full full time. But it was in the early fall, so we kind of assumed she'd be here, and she was. And we have keys to her house. No, no, and no, no, she no, no, has no, no. keys to no, our house. No, Arna, you're wrong. At that time, she did not have the key to our house. No, she didn't have. That no. That was when we decided that we should have keys to yes. each other's houses. So we call her up and we say, we need the set of keys uh, for, for our car, because our car is in the airport and we can't open it. And then we had our house keys, because we remembered the house keys. But we yeah, didn't. we had the house key, so, but we didn't have the car key. So I our, said we, uh, lost, we forgot everything. Yeah, so our solution was to give the car keys to a bus driver that was going yeah, to drive the route, right? So we, we went to the bus and we gave the key to the bus driver and we said, Hello, Mr. Bus Driver, this is the key to our house and a neighbor of ours is going to be waiting for you at the bus stop closest to our house. And could you please give her the key? And so uh, the bus driver took the key and gave it to our neighbor who was waiting at the bus stop. Uh, she came into the house, uh, got the car key, and then she went back to the bus stop and then another bus going on. <laughs> she gave the key to the bus driver and said, Arne and Carlos will be waiting for you um, with the in house the key station. and the car key. And that's how we got the car key for yeah. our car. Uh, and then we, could, we had to stay one night in Oslo because we couldn't go home because... The car was blocked. Actually, no, the, we had and we had work to do. And we had Oslo. work, so yeah. that. But that was. Yeah. So talk about why leaving. did we talk about this? Because we were talking about how we lose things. Okay, everywhere. that's that's yeah. okay. I forgot. I, lo- I lost. Yeah. And we've also direction. done more more spectacular things. Our neighbor has had to save us uh, on many occasions. Once we went on holiday to Greece. And that's when you were throwing the garbage. I threw, yeah, that, that's the last thing we did before we drove. I threw some garbage in the ca- garbage can. And when we arrived into the airport, I realized that the car key's gone. And uh, no, that was the house. That was the house key. That was the house key. Yeah. And uh, we called our neighbor and said, "Our house key is gone." But I remember distinctly that we locked the house. So what you did, you actually you had the the key to the house on In my hand. finger, yes, with the garbage, and to throw everything away. Yeah. So we made our neighbor go into the garbage can to look for the key. What's that uh, called when you jump into these bins? This I, she had to jump into the bins to find the key. <laughs> so, and if you, in case you're wondering, we have a great relationship <laughs> with our neighbor. Uh, <laughs> she knows we're a little bit all over the place, and uh, she expects that we screw things up from time to time. But um, actually, we have a great relationship. So, uh, making her dr- uh, d- uh, dive into a dumpster hasn't actually uh, that dumps. Dumpster dra- diving. Yeah, diving. That's, yeah. that's the word. That's but it, a nice it hasn't, word. It, and it hasn't made her hate us. No, no, no. So luckily we have a great relationship with her and, and it's, it's fine. But yeah, we do a lot of those things because our minds are a little bit all over the place. Yeah. Um, it happens all happens the time. It happens all the time. And so we'll see if our eggs turn up in South Korea or maybe they're in Minneapolis. I mean, Or maybe they knows? are in one of the outhouses. Yeah. Because it's so messy, it's really hard to find stuff. Or maybe in or maybe Actually I, I should shouldn't say it's messy because you think it's messy. Actually I don't think. I think it's like creative chaos. Creative chaos. Yeah. And then you know so, but you know what? Tomorrow say say that we start a new collection for Rowan, because we're working with Rowan now. Mm-hmm. We are Rowan designers, as the Rowan people are telling us now all the time. So say that we do a a new collection for Rowan and we get a brief tomorrow, right? And mm-hmm. then we have to start looking for those yarns they sent us that yeah. are, are supposed to be for that that we don't know where they are right now so That's... if we start looking for those balls of yarns i bet you we're gonna find the eggs yeah, because you always find stuff if you don't look for it we're gonna find the eggs when we look for the for the yarns the balls of yarn and then we're gonna have to tell rowan we can't find the balls we've got eggs but we don't have balls <laughs> so yeah. could you send us some more yarn because we need to start the collection for you for you so it's always that like that it always starts but that, always, that's always, actually really strange because every time you need something, it's impossible to find it. And then we don't need it, you find and it. And you don't need it, you look for something totally different, then it's right, it's right, in, right in front of your nose or mm-hmm. something. That is it's really strange. Why is it like that? I is this know. like the universe, is how the universe works? I or? think it's how the universe works. I think that, uh, I think that the words Arne, you know, hears the most from me are uh, the following. 
I say to Arne, well, maybe if you had it a little bit tidier, it wouldn't be so difficult to find what you're looking for. Actually, you were cleaning up the, the room we call like the studio or what do you call it? Like it's the studio, Arne. It's my workroom. It's actually, it's for the two of us, but there's no space for you anymore because I have so much stuff lying around. Yeah. And you forced me to, to clean it. And I said, you can do it. And you did. And you know what? I still can't find stuff. I'm still looking for stuff. And then you ask me and I'm... I yeah, because like... you are... You were cleaning. Yeah. So you see, there should be a little bit messy because that's when you know where you have your stuff. Maybe. Too clean is not good. I don't I know. think. I think that... Uh, I think that it should be... You know, everything should be in its place. Like in the kitchen, you know. I know where the plates are. But the place can be... The, a, the place are. can be a messy place. Yeah, but I know where it is. It's in its place. It's under a ton of paper and behind <laughs> 14 books or under yeah, yarn yeah. in the corner. Yeah. That's its place. I agree. There's I mean, no it's, problem. It's creative chaos. It's designers as, as, at work. I, I don't know if people really know what we do uh, and how much of it we do, but we are always working years ahead i think a lot of people don't know what we do because a lot of people ask us what are you do f doing for a living okay so what we do for a living is, is design this? we're we're designers <laughs> um and we've been doing this uh, for a living for the past 16 years uh, we founded arne and carlos in 2002 and our job consists uh in product design we design a lot of things we have a lot of clients that we work for mm -hmm. and, uh, and with, and we design a lot of products. Uh, usually they are based on textile because we are uh, textile designers. Arne has a background in fashion design. He is uh, educated from one of, the, there's three schools of design in Oslo, and he comes from one of them. Uh, and uh, he has a degree in fashion design from there. And then when Arne graduated, the day after, they headhunted him to become a teacher, part of the faculty. And so he taught design to first year and third year students for four years. Then we started our brand uh, in uh, 2002. We had a gap there that we did other things. Um, and we've been working ever since. Uh, and then, of course, we also we were guest lecturers. There's another school for design um, in Oslo. It's more like a college. Mm. It's not a university level, it's more college level. Where we talk about... Yeah, we were there every year as, as... Yeah, we were there every year as guest lecturers doing uh, workshops on inspiration and how to work... How to do their... How to build up a creative universe yeah. and... Uh, scrapbooks or... Yeah. How to use their inspiration in the design and mm -hmm. things like that. Yeah. And, and how to build a brand. Yeah. And we've done a number of products. Uh, started as a fashion brand. We had uh, women's wear. We've done wovens and knitwear. Uh, we've done menswear. Mm -hmm. uh, exhibited our collections in fashion weeks in New York, Paris, Copenhagen. Uh, sold uh, knitwear, ready to, ready, ready to wear clothing and knitwear to stores all over the world. Uh, we've freelanced uh, a lot. We've collaborated with many brands. Uh, we've done knitwear for Urban Outfitters. We've done mm -hmm. knitwear for a brand called Comme des Garçons. Mm -hmm. We designed for two very well-known um, sports brands uh, in Norway and that we can't talk about. And a Danish brand? Uh, we work for, yeah, a Danish brand. Uh, we do a lot of uh, design. Uh, we, we work with wine, actually. We do a lot of packaging, wine label design. Uh, so we do wine labels. Uh, we've done bicycles. We yeah, yeah we've designed a decor for bicycles. We've done uh, we've worked for the Norwegian Arts and Crafts Association. Yeah, we did uh, knitwear design for the Norwegian Arts and Crafts Society, and then we also got this golden medal for the work we do with the spreading Norwegian knit knitwear and mm -hmm. knitwear design around yeah. the world. And we are we're like, I think there's not so many people who got that gold medal no in norway not so many no i think it's About maybe five, it's or six. five or six and we are two of those yeah and that was really nice we got this medal and the diploma and it was like a dinner with the queen of norway yeah we sat at the table with the queen which with, really with the queen that was real she was a really nice person yeah and she because she's the high high patron of mm. the arts and crafts association so she was there 
the day when we were presented with the golden medal. So it was really nice. nice. It's nice when you work with this for for so many years, and then we get like recognition. Is it called? Yeah, Re- recognition. Recognition mm-hmm. from the arts and craft crafts community in Norway. Yeah. So that that was a huge honor. Yeah. So we've done we've done a number of things nowadays. Uh, of course, and then of course we've got the bo- books that we do. I'd say that uh, they're design books, so we work a lot with the design aspect of the project, but also the design of the book. Great mm-hmm. team that we always have. It's usually the same team, the photographer, the stylist, Arn and me, and then we've got a graphic designer. And our role is not only to do the book, uh, the projects in the book, but we also are heavily involved in the design of the book. So I would like to call us art directors in terms of what yeah. we do with the books. We do the art direction. Because like normally when we do books, we have this idea about what, of course, of what, what the book, the content, contents of the book, but mm-hmm. we also have ideas of pictures. So then sometimes we actually do sketches in black and white. We do like drawings of how some pictures should look. Mm-hmm. If there are pictures we really want to have, yeah, and then we build up those pictures with the stylist because we have a tendency to put too much stuff in the picture. Yeah, because we're not stylists. No, we are designers. But but we know what we want to show yeah. in the picture because we know the inspiration behind the product. Mm-hmm. But it's really good to have the stylist to put take away stuff. Yeah. And then and that's a, a lot of yeah, and then the theme of the book, the pictures, everything is set up by us in collaboration with the photographer, the stylist, and then the designer. The graphic designer works closely with us. We do the fonts, we do the 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 layout together with the designer. We say this, we want that, we know like this, but like that, blah blah blah, and that's how we do our books. And I know that for a fact because there's a lot of other authors um, in Norway that work with our photographer, but our photographer tells us that we're the only ones. That he actually collaborates with. He says that normally he get a, a box with, 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 stuff. with stuff. And then they just rent a house or a location. And shoot it. And they shoot the pictures. Without the designer there. So it's different. I mean, we're not only doing the, the design of the projects. We're doing the whole thing. So we want to be involved because it's our work. It's our job. Yeah. 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 I, I remember another thing that we've done a lot of. We've done a fashion illustration as well for magazines. Yeah. Remember? Yeah. Tick. Tick. We did a few uh, really cool illustrations and we, for them. Yeah, and we also did, did done some illustrations for for a book about weddings. Yeah, 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 yeah that's true. So yeah. we made like drawings of wedding dresses, yeah. and we also made wedding dresses. Yes. And but we don't do don't order your wedding dress from us because we don't do that anymore. We don't so. No. I mean, we, we know, sew, but we know how to sew. We but haven't we don't. made a dress for a long, long time. Yeah, but we we know how to do it because, like, that's our background. Yeah, so that's a little bit of what we do, uh, and yeah, and we're always busy. There's always stuff to do. Uh, if we're not touring, we're designing a collection for Rowan, or we're working on a new book, or we're working on another big project. Uh, the wine designing takes a lot of our time as well it's a fun project because you're working mm. on on small wine labels and it's it's really fun uh, and yeah there's always a project for us uh, if we want it uh, we get offered a lot of different things and some things we do some things we don't we did we did a whole collection of paper products paper as well collection. for a crafts uh, company in, yeah. Nor- in Scandinavia uh, we designed porcelain as well so that, that, that yeah the, the list goes on and on and on you know I'm cleaning my computers now and it's amazing how much we've done that I, I don't remember like that's true I found a picture recently of, of a folk costume we made we what? made we made a folk you don't remember we made a folk costume with embroideries of Fire. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. For McCann, yeah. Yeah, for the brown cheese, Norwegian yeah, brown yeah. cheese. Yeah, now I remember. Commercial. Yeah, I remember. Okay, and so I that's... just found the picture. You remember? I was making this embroidery yeah. of the flames, like what you see on motorcycles or yeah. cars. Yeah, the burning. The burning stuff, and yeah. it's a traditional folk costume in black wool, but it has embroideries of fire. Mm. And my, I remember, I was. Had, we had a deadline and I was doing yeah. these embroideries for hour, hour or days, yeah. non-stop. My finger was pointing up it in the air. It was I couldn't bend my finger. When I was yeah. driving the car, my, point, my thumb was up in the air all the time. 
And that was a job that we got. That was also a freelance job, a design job that we did for a huge advertising agency called McCann, where they were doing this whole rebranding of a very famous Norwegian brown cheese. It's made of goat. It's a goat cheese. And it kind of tastes like caramel. It's really good. It's, it's very traditional Norwegian. But they wanted to do a, a new package, a repack, or the company, the, the dairy company wanted to do a repackaging design uh, and an advertising campaign. And the idea was old traditions in a new costume. So they contacted us to ask us to interpret old traditions in, new, in a new costume and do three different three different scenes for them to do in a photo shoot mm. uh, that were going to be illustrating the cheese. And that's when we actually designed the Space Invader sweater. Uh, because that was one of the items yeah. in the... So the Space Invader sweater was the, the, the traditional Norwegian sweater where we exchanged the, the pattern for a Space Invader pattern. But a Norwegian would recognize the traditional Norwegian sweater in it. Mm. The second scene was the, the skier. The skier with like this traditional skiing outfit yeah but not it, traditional like like what people wear now you know like no actually yeah it was a dress yeah it was a ski, skiing dress it was a skier and she was wearing uh she was wearing a kind of like a version of a folk costume but using it to ski so it was kind of like a old the old folk costume but in a new way yeah. and then the third one was the folk costume but instead of the embroidered flowers it had the flames so it kind of reflecting all that young culture with all the uh all the um, cars that was a and lot motorcycles. Of work. Yeah, that yeah. folk costume was a lot of work. Yeah, and I, I never made a folk costume before. Yeah. So we really, we really had to make the pattern on the dummy, and we had to cut it and sew it and make it looks look like a folk mm-hmm. costume. But luckily, it when cool. when when we do get those advertising jobs, they do pay very well. So they are very worthwhile <laughs> considering mm-hmm. that there's a lot of work involved, but the pay is really good. So. We should actually go for some more advertising I don't think people re- realize how much work it is to design something. Because a lot of people think we just make some crosses on the paper. Or yeah. you just grab some yarn and you knit something. And wow, there's the design. But actually it doesn't work that, that way. At least not for us. Not for us. Because there's a lot of thinking going into a product. Yeah, when so... So the first thing, you know, if we're going to talk a little bit about design and designing products, the first thing I want to talk about is the bird, uh, the, 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 the legs of the bird. Because we came up with this idea to do like a metal, to do metal legs. And it's got like, a, it's got like uh, the metal goes around the, the tummy and you just plonk the bird in there. It's kind of like a, like a, like a stand, a bird stand. And uh, we thought that was funny. We thought it was hilarious, but it was also a lot of work involved in designing it because you want to make the you want to make the the metal look like an element that is actually cool, but it's a design element, so it's actually supposed to be there. And then I remember, uh, I think because we've done a video on it where we show the legs, and I remember somebody commenting that maybe the metal thing that is showing on the outside should be on the inside, and that actually that really broke my heart. Because but you know, if someone wants to have the metal in, inside, yeah. put it inside. Yeah, but it broke my heart because in terms of the, of the bird, it's a designer bird. The bird. A bird doesn't look like a knitted bird anyway. Uh, this is a knitted bird with the, with the thing going across its belly that you just plonk it in like a stand. And it was, the idea was that it was supposed to be like that. And then when somebody's saying that maybe it should be on the inside, they think that it's disturbing it somehow when it's actually a design element that is really cool uh, and when you can't really you can't really pretend it's a it's a real bird because it isn't so what's the point in hiding the legs you know what i mean mm. it's just like it's the design element of that and uh yeah and i mean 99.9 percent of the people understand that uh, and there's always somebody who doesn't and um yeah and i feel so miserable because it's like I failed. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, <laughs> if they don't understand, it's because we failed. But it isn't. I mean, it's just that people... I think it was a good idea. It was a good idea. And people see these things differently. But, you know, it takes a long time to figure out these know, things out. But, you know, I see a lot of things differently from other people. But I don't tell people. <laughs> yeah. I, was like, yeah. I, I don't have to tell people that I, don't, I think something is stupid. Because I keep it to myself. Mm. So... I, I don't think about these things. Yeah. It's not my problem. I If I want to have a metal, like a, a wire foot on the outside of the bird, I do it. Yeah. If I want to have a 
piece of wood, like a wooden stick. I just put it up in the belly of yeah. the bird and I use that as a feet. I think it has to do a lot about, you know, how people are. Because some people are creative, some people are not creative. And uh, some people are open-minded, some people are not open-minded. They're more narrow-minded. And they, some people, you know, they see something and they can interpret it as something else. Other people, they can only interpret it as the thing they see. So it's, it's, it's always very different depending on who it is, you know. Somebody who says that it has to be this way because it's always been like that. Or you have the other person who's more open to a change. And, and I think, yeah, you can't really please everybody. But we do have we do have see a lot of design um, out there. Um, we don't really want to give our uh, points of view on you know things that we see. But sometimes, directly. sometimes for me, I don't know if it's the same for you also. But I can blame it on my teacher background. Sometimes yeah. the teacher, the design teacher, kicks in, and I see a lot of stuff that wouldn't go through first year in design school because there's like a lot of wrong things. It's wrong, like, wrong in the sense that they're not. Uh, it's not flattering. I don't know if you put some a lot of patterns on your behind. Behind, <laughs> is that the right word? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess you have to be careful. So put 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 a lot of eight leaf roses or something on your behind. That's I think not very flattering. No, no. maybe not even if you have a nice behind. Yeah, because. You don't want to have the focus on the wrong place. Mm. Or there's another one. If you put put a lot of stripes around your belly, that's a nice way to get attention to your belly. If you have a big one. Or even if you have a small one, because you, it will add more volume around your waist. Yeah. So then I think there should be stripes all over, or you put the stripes on top. Yeah. What I think is cool nowadays, because... I can mention. A yeah. Lot well, let's of do this. this in a more structured way. Okay. I'm thinking. I'm thinking. What is cool is that uh, nowadays anybody can actually do designing because you've got, especially if you're, if you do crafts, if you do knitting, crocheting, embroidery, you can make up your own designs and you can put them on Ravelry. You can put them on Etsy, right? And I mean, we're we're not here to judge anybody's design. I think in the end of the day, if somebody is interested in your design and purchases the pattern then it means that for that person it's a good design and that's that's great it's very democratic nowadays design mm -hmm. has become so democratic anybody can give it a go and i think it's good i think it's good we see a lot of talented people we see some people that need a little guidance and i think that we could give you a few points if well, you're if you if you if there's a designer in you that really wants to come out uh, uh, let's give let's give people a few points to consider. I like I like what Coco Chanel said. Mm -hmm. You see, Coco Chanel uh, said something very clever about dressing. She said that uh, when you get dressed to go out, before you go out, look in the mirror and take something off. I think Iris Apfel says, "Look in the mirror and puts put an extra thing." Yeah. On. So they yeah, can but, be both ways. Well, yeah. Okay, but Iris Apfel is uh, she's born with a lot of style and she's professional. She's so good. she knows what she's doing. Most people get it wrong. Mo most people, if they put more stuff on, they get it wrong. But what I wanted to say was that design-wise, it, it kind of works the same way. When you're thinking of doing a design, uh, look at it and see if you have too many ideas in one. Because too many ideas in one actually creates an over-designed piece that is not good. For example, if you're, doing, if you're designing a, a scarf, say you're doing a, a scarf, right? And in that scarf, you do, you do cables, you do fair isle, you do brioche, you do some garter stitch. But there's a lot of uh, you, scarves around. Yeah, but my point is you don't need to do a scarf no, no. with 40 different techniques. But a lot of people do. Yeah, but take a few things off. Yeah. Simplify it. Look at, look at what works. Look at the parts that you think are the nicest and focus on those, take away all the other techniques. I remember like one of the rules we had in fashion school was that you shouldn't use all your ideas on one Th that's pro exactly what project. I'm saying. You should that's spread it all over. Yeah. So, so but any, anyhow, a lot of people like a lot of stuff on things. Yeah, but it, had, but it has to be done well. So yeah. if you do, I think that's a if, you put, if you put a lot of, if you do a maximalist design, you need to balance it well. You need to look at the pattern, you need to look at the size of the garment and you need to balance it well. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that if you look at a sweater, how many, how many, you should maybe divide it into three thirds. 
Yeah, about. that could be nice if you put the right things in the right place. Yeah, one third is the, 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 the shoulders mm. down to the chest. Then you've got the, uh, the, the, the waist area and then the bottom area. Mm. And then you divide it in three and then you can see a little bit of the surface you're but working in. But don't put in. everything on the waist area. No. S spread it. Yeah. And, and there's, a, oh, there was another thing. Um, oh, I lost it. Pattern placement. Pattern placement. No, if, if you have, if, if you put something on, the, on, like on the garment, don't do the flag mistake. That's a big mistake. That's yes. a big mistake. You if the design looks like it's a flag, you have to rethink. Throw it away. Throw it Start away. Start again. The, the flag is the worst thing. Mm. That's one of the things we killed all the time when I was a teacher in fashion school. It was if something looked like a flag. Yeah, and then you have a and then you have a, a, a um, an expression in the design world that we use all the time. It's kill your darlings. Yeah, and that it is... doesn't mean it doesn't mean that they're bad. It, you can have you know so, talking about darling. A darling is a design that you're in love with, that you do, and that you love more than any of the other designs that you do and you love it so much that you become completely blind to the content context you, you think it's great because and sometimes it is uh, but maybe it doesn't fit the exactly. rest exactly but That's normally like a lot of people like they don't do whole collect like now people are designers but they do like one piece and that's the design yeah they don't do collections but anyway when killing your darling means doesn't mean that you're killing it forever. It means that you don't maybe you can't use it right now because it's not working with whatever what the other things you have. Mm. And we have a killed darling that has come recently. It's a design submission that we did for Rowan. We did like nine design submissions, and out of those nine, uh, six of them made it to the magazine, and three of them didn't. And I was very surprised when I saw what didn't make it because it was the best design. But then, if you think about it. Maybe because we don't know what else has been submitted and we don't mm. know how they're building the collection. But prob it's not because it's a bad design. It's mm. because the design does not work with the other pieces. So it's all about seeing the whole thing, the whole story, not only focusing on that particular thing. So, you know, being more open minded and looking at the whole the whole thing mm. and then figuring out whether it should be there or not. And, you know, when you're killing it, you're not killing it forever. You're just taking it out and maybe putting it back in another time. Yeah, in another so, collection. So yeah. always be critical about your designs. When you're doing them, look at them. If you're doing, say you're doing, um, as, you know, you want to do a series of socks, right? You do, say, six socks in a bundle that you're going to be selling your patterns on, on, on Ravelry. Look at all those six socks and try looking at them cohesively. See if they fit together. If something sticks out, even if you love it, take it out and then mm. use it again but, another time. But do people do collections on, on Ravelry? I've don't never know, been if, there. If they do? I think people do just one piece. So there's actually no darling to kill. Or you have to... Well, unless it's too much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Unless it, there's too many... Because there's a lot of... Design, but it's not collections. Yeah, I think so. Those are things. I mean, we're not laughing at anybody here. We're not pointing out a particular designer because we don't do that. We're just talking about risks of things that you can, you know, traps that people can fall into that you should be aware of. So try. So just to sum it up, try not to put too many ideas in one design. So if you got a pair of socks, try making them, you know, beautiful but simplify. You know, don't put cables, don't put fair isle, don't put brioche, don't put garter stitch, don't put, you know, this, 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 this and that, and then add a fringe on top of it because it's going to be too much. Just keep it simple. Simple is always better in these, in these cases. So as Chanel said, take something off. <laughs> uh, kill your darlings in the sense that if you're doing a little collection, if you're doing six socks, like an example, look at those six socks and try to look at them from a cohesive point of view. See if they all fit if together. If they don't fit or... together, if there's something that sticks out in a bad way, take it out. It doesn't mean you can't use it, but maybe you can use it another time. And then, of course, with pattern placement, always think about balance and symmetry. Always divide things in thirds. You know, look at things in three parts and try to find the right proportion and try to put the pat pattern 
where it belongs proportion wise so that's mm -hmm. also a good tip and then the final thing is the flag design be, be careful because you don't want to look like the flag of france or the flag of cameroon or something like that you you know you don't want to look like a flag no so don't do three colors in in a field in, in that way because that is not very and appealing. if you're going to break some of those rules or what you call it Maybe not rules, but... Well, you call them rules, and they are to be broken. But yeah, then you should be good. Yeah. Because you... sometimes there are people who are actually breaking the rules. And doing it well. But And they're doing it really well. And I've, we've seen some, like from, but that's more from catwalks, where they actually break rules, and it's really good. Yeah. But... But that demands quite a lot of skill, you know. I mean, it needs... You need a trained eye... And um, and that does take a lot of time to learn. Uh, for you example, know, like I, if... I have an eye for antiques. Yeah. A friend of us told me I had a good eye for antiques. I'm sure you do. Not that I know what's valuable or anything, but I know what I'm looking for so I can scan the room. That's true, yes. <laughs> I find things un that are hidden under yeah. shelves. And, and, and we've also trained our eye in terms of what we see. We go to a lot of museums. That's a lot of our work. Because a lot of our work is in the creative field, we get inspired by art, uh, modern art, but also the old masters. Mm -hmm. And we've kind of learned how to look at art. And that's something you can train. You know, the more museums you go to, the more art you look or at, the more, or... the more your eye gets trained mm -hmm. to look at things. It's, it's not, never about what's right or wrong, because that's not what we're saying. But you look at a work of art and you realize that it's relevant for you. That is what you like, and then you look at another one, and you say, that is what I don't like. And so when you go to a museum, you learn how to scan the museum so that you're actually looking at what you love, and what you're not loving, you're not even looking at it. And that way you can actually absorb more of the things you love. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this can be done with design as well. If you start looking at clothing, if you start dividing them, if you st in terms of balancing, if you, if you look at uh, things in thirds, looking at pattern proportion, where the pattern goes. But once you start doing that with every single garment you're seeing, if you're looking for patterns on Revelry, if you're looking at a Vogue runway, look at the way the patterns are pl placed, do that often, and then your eye will start to train and you will start to learn about proportion. And also, if you want to work as a professional designer, it's like to, to make collections and stuff, you should also learn how to look for trends mm. because that's something you also it's nothing it's like something you have to learn in a way it's like looking at art and looking at other stuff you have to know what you're looking for and you also have to to kind of understand the world you're living in and you have to understand results of what's going on in the world yeah. how that will have an influence of what people think or, or as simple as which colors people will choose it's all based on things that's going on in the world and then of course the trend doesn't necessarily mean that it's a short-term trend it's not about the length of a skirt because there are long-term trends as well that can influence the way people think um, we have a long-term trend that has been here now for for many many years it's the digital trend versus the real things you know it's all about all the crafts and all the things that people do with their hands. And it's kind of like a counter trend to the digital world and social media. So you've got, you know, when one thing happens, the opposite also happens. And it's all about recognizing that and learning how to figure out what's going to be the next in terms of next, that. The next big thing. Yeah. And of course, um. when we were, and now some tips for uh, people who want to design. We'll give you a few tips on uh, what to look for. Okay. So, um Depending on where you're coming from, uh, there's always traditions and heritage all over the world. Um, and it's always a good idea to look at your own traditions and heritage. So if you're American, for example, look at Americana, look at things that are done with patchwork, look at um, the Wild West, look at the Native American crafts, look at those things because they belong to your culture and see if you can find elements that you love. And then bring these elements out and then make them your own. And that's a great way to create a modern and new mm. something. You can even work on your, like, your personal universe. Exactly. It's, that's what we thought 
uh, the students in when I was a teacher that you should actually look at your own life. You should look at what you were obsessed by or you your interest since you were a little kid, because what you experience as a kid will influence your whole adulthood, grown up yeah. adult adulthood. Mm-hmm. So actually, if you have if you have stuff from you were a kid, or if you have pictures of stuff you liked when you were a kid, you should collect these these things. Mm-hmm. If you have the 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 what you call the physis, physical stuff, mm-hmm. or if you have just pic- pictures or drawings or stuff, you should put it in a book or put it in a box. Yeah, and- create your own personal universe. That's a great way to work with inspiration. And and for us, we've always been working with the things that we love. Even when we were in the fashion industry, we were still looking at arts and craft. We were still looking at folk costumes. We were still mm. looking at Scandinavian uh, heritage in knitting. And we we're taking those elements and making them modern, putting them in a modern, fashionable content. And that is a great way to work with design because it gives you all this material. Like if you're Japanese, look at kimonos, look at the way mm. they dye with indigo, look at all these wonderful... Perhaps if you're Italian, there's loads, or French, there's loads of stuff in folk costumes mm. as well, in the culture, in the manufacturing of, of... And there's like a lot of, lot of, there's more, like, for us, like being Norwegian, it's not just being Norwegian, in a way. It, it's like, if you're, not, if, if you're like Norwegian, you just don't look at folk costumes, and, and there's so much other stuff which is connected to you as a person. Mm-hmm. If you're so, from, yeah. look at your family history. Look at every your interest. If you live in everything, a, if you live in an area of outstanding national beauty, like for example, if you come from Iceland, look at the volcanoes, look at the the nature, look at the landscape. Try to recreate that in your designs. So it's always about looking at history. It's always about looking at heritage. It's always looking about uh, looking at your in- environment and being inspired by what is next to you, what is in front of you. Uh, in order to create something special and new. So that's one of the biggest tips that we have uh, for anybody out there wanting to be a designer or actually trying, giving it a go. And of course, col- and another, color. A color, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you were going to say... No, yeah, no. And then I was also thinking, if you want to be a designer, learn how to make a drawing of the garment on the figure. Learn how to make a drawing... A sketch. A like sketch a... or... A, and, and also... If you if you're gonna design and give it for someone to produce, you need to know how to put put measurements. You need to know how the body or the clothing are working on your on the body. Yeah. So there's there's like a lot of stuff you have to consider, and yeah. it's always nice to know how to put those measurements and to know how to make a drawing, and. Yeah, so taking classes basically is always a good way to learn anything. Yeah, I think that's... Yeah. And then in terms of color, if you have, uh, like for example, if you have a picture of something you love uh, and you want to recreate a design using those colors, that's really easy. You just look at the colors and try to get the same, if you're knitting something, get the colors from the yarn store. We had this lovely little aquarelle that we used to do, uh, that we used to look at for uh, Norwegian inspiration. It was from the 20s. It was French. It was an aquarelle painting of skiers in the way the French thought the Norwegians were. So the colors were all off, but they were so beautiful. And then we brought, took that little aquarelle with us to the yarn store and picked the colors from the, the painting mm. and then used them in projects. So that's a great way to work with, with colors that we, we highly recommend. So it's all about training your eye, going to museums, training your eye, looking at garments, looking at balance, looking at proportion. Uh, working with your cultural heritage, working with the inspiration of the things you love. And when you do that, you will create real products that are 100% you and that you can be proud of and that hopefully people will love. And again, if you put them on Etsy, if you put them on Ravelry and people are loving them and are buying them, then it is a great compliment to you. It means that uh, you're succeeding, which is great. And as I say, it's design is becoming more and more democratic now that everybody can self-publish. And I think it's a good thing because it gives a lot of variation in this world. A lot of things... But, because... it, but are like... Uh, I, I, I was making... I made a drawing for a new garage, but that doesn't make me an architect. No, 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 of no. course not. <laughs> so of that's not, not democratic. 
No, but the no. I no. would never get a job in an architect office. No, of course no. not. That, but that's a whole other story for another time. <laughs> uh, since that is, you know, it's not necessarily what we're talking about here. But I understand what you mean. Um, yeah. An architect is an architect. A designer is a designer, and then you've got people that are doing it on the side and enjoying it, but for their own personal pleasure. Yeah. And those are the people that we are addressing here, I suppose, because if people are trained designers, they don't need our advice. They mm -hmm. know. They know anyway what they need to do and how they do it is their, is their business. So yeah, we're looking at uh, finishing off the bird, stuffing it now. Uh, this time we're using the normal stuffing that we have. Uh, but we did a tutorial a few weeks ago that... Uh, we used the leftover? The one? leftover that we carded. Yeah. A lot of people were commenting that uh, you could buy these, these brushes at the dog store as well. And I agree, you can do that as well. Uh, it's just that we got the carters in a thrift store for nothing. I think we paid ten dollars mm. for them. So there are a lot of comments about. We didn't them being, spend a lot of money, so. No, but there was a lot of comments about carters being very expensive, and and we were very surprised because the ones we got were ten dollars in a thrift store. Somebody just threw them in the store; they didn't want them, mm. and we walked in and we got them. So anyway, if you can't find carters in 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 that price point, yeah, go to the go to the dog store and get brushes, but they're not as as. Um, as long lasting, obviously, so you probably need to go again and get new ones when they wear out. Or if it's too expensive, then you buy wool. Well, actually, wool is very expensive, aren't it? Uh, so buy cotton. No, the synthetic thing. Yeah, or yeah. just go to the pet store. <laughs> go That's, pet uh... store. <laughs> and as you can see, we're filling in the bird with a, with a pen uh, and shaping it as we fill it. Uh, and because we're working with wool, wool is very bouncy, so it's easy to shape. Um, and this is how we do it. We want to have a nice, well-shaped uh, bird. bird. And you have to squeeze the neck when you feel the head to, to make it more sharp, mm -hmm. kind of. So now when this is finished, uh, I will, we will put, put on the sequence. And the feathers. And the feathers. Which will be two separate podcasts. Yeah. And since this one is going to have a lot of stuff... I use leftover yarn, so there's like no, that's not so important which color you, you use if you're going to put a lot of stuff on top of the bird anyway. So you can get get rid of a lot of leftover yarn yeah. by making a little bird that you decorate. Yeah. And these are going to be, I don't know, where are we going to put these? The Christmas tree? Are I, we gonna... I think we put it under the glass. Oh, under the glass dome. Dome yeah, with the other one. we have a collection one. of... Of birds of paradise. Yeah. yeah. So this one will join the other birds, I guess. Yeah. So we're always we're always looking for new ideas, new new tutorials. Uh, we'd love it. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, please tell us what you think. Tell us what we should do. Uh, we do need a lot of tips. I mean, we've been doing this for almost well. We've been doing it for a little over two years, and sometimes I feel like we're running out of ideas until I read comments of people suggesting things. So um, what you think about uh, our tutorials is very important to us, especially what you think that we are not doing, that we should be doing. Like, this is not a tutorial. I keep saying tutorial, but it's not. Uh, this is, after all, a, a, just a podcast. But if, and I know a lot of people enjoy the podcast, but if people have a specific thing they're looking for, they can't get it, uh, the knowledge, uh, you know. If, and we, if know, we know how, we can show if it. If we know how, we can show it. But, but we there's need a lot to of know. stuff we don't know. Yeah, but what we know uh, that we can show, we still need to know what it is because sometimes we take things for granted yeah. that other people um, are struggling with that we're not struggling with and so we don't think about it. So if there's anything you, you would like to know, if there's anything, any tutorial that you would like to see, we will appreciate uh, your comments on the comment field of this video or one of the more recent videos. So please feel free to, to do that. And then we can do And then we can do video. more. Uh, these podcasts, uh, we're aiming for once a month. Unfortunately, in March, we weren't able to, to do a podcast. Uh, too busy working with uh, other projects, especially finishing up uh, some collections that we've been doing for Rowan uh, that we actually showed in, at the H&H &H in Cologne. Let's talk about the H&H. &H. As the and if you watch this in 2020, this is 2018. 18. So March 2018, <laughs> we went to the H&H &H to launch our first uh, collection with Rowan. 
which will be available in the beginning of August. It's a woman's wear collection uh, made in uh, felted tweed and kid silk case. Rowan told us to choose uh, whatever yarns we wanted, and those are the ones we chose. Uh, we were very much in love with kid silk case. I it's love it. So beautiful when you knit with uh, felted tweed and you do the, all the pattern work in, in felt kid in kid silk that is so beautiful but kid silk case was, on its own is also a stunning yarn and i think it's very modern if you're uh, doing fair isle knitting and knitting with kid silk case you get a completely different look uh, with a yarn like that um, i'm gonna be knitting myself a sweater in uh, in kid silk case i think it's a it's a great yarn um, and i really want to work with that I see a new UFO coming. A new UFO is going to be a, a men's striped sweater in kids look case. Or are you talking about the bird? No, I'm talking about the sweater you're making. Uh, so, no, the sweater that I'm not making. I'm finished now with my bird. So I'm yeah. going to put on the... And now we're going to look for an embroidery uh, yeah. idea. So there will be... the sequence embroidery. Sequence and feathers. It, it won't be looking like this one, but something... Something similar. Something but similar. Same, same, but different. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So but that... anyway, back to the H&H &H as a finishing thing. Back to the H&H &H yeah. as a finishing thing. We'd really love to... Uh, yeah, we're looking forward to showing the collection uh, in, in, a, in, uh, sorry, in August. We already showed it to the buyers. And uh, the, the response was really, really great. Uh, and it's a women's wear collection, and now we're working on a men's wear collection. Yes, which yeah. hopefully will be uh, next year again, and uh, and yeah, and, and now we will be designing more and more uh, for Rowan and patents, and of course continue with our Regia projects. And by the way, I, we forgot to talk about that. Uh, you know, when we're telling people all the things we've done, we forgot to mention Regia, which is the mm. most successful collaboration. We could talk for three we've, hours. We've ever had, exactly. <laughs> we could talk for three hours, but we are now running out of time. Uh, it's been a couple of hours. It's been fun knitting this sock. Sorry, this, <laughs> now, now I'm talking about Regia and now I'm mixing it up. It's the been bird. fun. It's been fun it's knitting bird. this bird. We hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, you've probably had a lot of tea. Uh, while you've been listening to us talking and knitting on your own projects thank you so much for uh, for watching and put the bird on it and put a bird on it <laughs> okay bye, bye. <laughs>